بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين ولا عاقبة المتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. So I have a pretty difficult task. I'm supposed to tell you how to be a forgiving person in 25 minutes. So uh, instead, what I'll do, inshallah, is I'll just go ahead and I'll, I'll briefly talk about a few ayat in the Quran, and from that we can draw uh, some of the benefits. Because you know, uh, Subhanallah, Al Khatib Al Baghdadi, he said something very powerful, Rahimahullah Taala. He said, if I was asked to speak for five hours on a subject, then I could do so with ease. But when I'm asked to convey a message in five minutes, then it's, it's a lot harder. Why? Because, subhanAllah, these are really huge concepts. And that was the gift of the Prophet wasallam. That with a few words, the Prophet wasallam always drove the point home. So, so he did not have to lecture for a long time to get the point across the way that we do because of our weakness. But, there, and, and obviously, this is what is so powerful about Al-Quran al Karim. You know, in the Qur'an, you would find that one ayah, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would just mention a few words and the tafsir, the explanation of that ayah, could go on and on and on and on for hours. So we'll just talk about two ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, in ayah number 132 or 133, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ And rush to the forgiveness of your Lord. وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا Rush to the forgiveness of your Lord and to a paradise that encompasses, that is so vast, it encompasses the entire heavens and the earth. It has been promised for those who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al muttaqin. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already gave you know, the, the characteristic of Al muttaqin, assign the attribute of Al muttaqin. And usually what we see happening in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention either a praiseworthy characteristic or a praiseworthy trait, and, that, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, الَّذِينَ And He will give the description. So, الَّذِينَ Those who, right? So, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Right? Uh, success, successful are the believers. Who are the believers? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will start mentioning their characteristics. وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ And the servants of the Rahman. الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا And the servants of the most merciful, those who, who walk lightly uh, on this earth. And whenever they're, they're given, you know, whenever they are um, attacked by those who are ignorant, whenever people are constantly chastising them, they only respond with salam, with peace. Right? الَّذِينَ Every time you see الَّذِينَ something is special. But here we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving an attribute or a praiseworthy characteristic of you know, muttaqeen and giving a small description and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving another characteristic of these people saying they are the muhsaneen. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so who are the muttaqeen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who give charity, not just when times are good, not just in times of ease, but they even give charity in times of hardship, right? وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْبِ Those who swallow their anger. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ And those who are forgiving towards people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives another trait, assigns another trait to these people. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And Allah loves those who excel. So in, the, in these three descriptions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us, we know that if, if a person applies these three things, they could become mutta, from the muttaqeen and they could become from the muhsineen. They could become from those, the, from those who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they could be from those who excel. Now what is so special about these three people? Or what is so special about a person who is able to do these three things? Essentially, ihsan means what? Someone answer me. What does ihsan mean? Someone can answer me. It's okay, I understand British. <laughs> what does ihsan mean? So, ihsan is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see Him. And whenever you realize that you cannot see Him, then you're completely aware of the fact that He sees you. So you act in a different way, right? 
So essentially, ihsan is, is such a quality that a person always goes to, you know, goes beyond what is expected of him to achieve the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He goes beyond what is expected of him from people to achieve the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, whenever a person is wealthy, whenever a person has money, everybody expects him to give. Right? You know, whenever we do fundraisers and things of that sort, everybody looks for the doctors, everybody looks for those who have money, everybody looks for the, for the big business owners. And, you know, sometimes even when you have celebrities and athletes and things of that sort, they always establish a charity foundation. Right? So when they're making millions and millions and millions of dollars or pounds, they give, you know, just a small portion. Why? Because that's expected of them. People expect that from you whenever you have a lot of money. But whenever you're poor, who expects you to give? Right? The only thing that would, you know, no one goes into a fundraiser and starts looking for a janitor or starts looking for, for the guy who's cleaning up the tables after the fundraiser to say, hey, you know, you need to give money. You know, you need to give money to charity. You should think about your hereafter. Everyone says, no, he's poor, leave him alone. But that person, out of his love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would bring himself to give even whenever he's in poverty and hardship. Why? Because he's not concerned with the standards of people around him. He's concerned with how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds him. So he's concerned with his rank in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he knows that even if I've got only five dollars or five pounds and I give one away for the sake of Allah, then that would be enough or that would be something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would look favorably upon. So although no one is expecting that from him, he does it anyway. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that the reward, the virtue of one dirham given for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has surpassed 100,000. So the companion said, how could the reward of one be greater than 100,000? Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said that the one who gave one, one dirham, was someone who was poor. He didn't have any, you know, he had barely anything. So imagine someone with two dollars or, you know, or two dirhams and he gives one away, right? So that shows that that takes a lot of strength, whereas the one who gave a hundred thousand had a million, had alf alf, right? A million. Didn't really hurt him that much. It didn't hurt his pocket. He gave his spare change away. It's a big, it's a big uh, you know, contribution and the reward for it will be great. And I'm sure that all of us would be satisfied if we were in a fundraiser and someone raised his hand for a hundred thousand. But in the sight of Allah, the one who gave one achieved more reward. Why? Because the one who gave a hundred thousand was expected to give something. But the one who gave one had nothing to gain from it except for elevation in the sight of who? In the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the next two are relevant to our topic. And those who swallow their anger. You know subhanAllah, it's one thing to, to not uh, take out your anger upon people. It's one thing to not have a temper. Right? But this isn't what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. And it's one thing, you know, to, to be kind when everyone else around you is kind and courteous. And unfortunately, that's how we usually take it. You know, it's, you know, no one expects you to go out of this door and start yelling at somebody because you're having a bad day. Right? If somebody holds the door for you, if someone uh, gives you a smile in the face, then you're expected to smile back. And, but, but here's the thing, when someone attacks you, or when someone insults you, if someone got up and was to say something about your mother right here, I think everyone in the room would expect you to, 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 to retaliate. Everyone would expect you to express your anger. Why? Because subhanAllah, that's our, those are our standards, right? But al-kalbi mean al-ghayb means someone who literally swallows his anger completely. You know, whenever, not, and, you know, it's one thing to, to not say anything, but you have this look on your face. Or you're rolling your eyes. Right? Or I don't know what you, you know, if you're clenching your fist. I don't know if people do that anymore. I think you do that when you're like 80 years old and you've got nothing else. To do. You know? But, you know, you, it's one thing to not say anything, but to express anger in your actions. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you know, someone who has ihsan, he swallows his anger completely. You look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, when he was walking with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, there, was, there was a group of people in Al-Madinah, they used to insult the Prophet ﷺ, but indirectly. You know, they would say to the Prophet ﷺ, Salaam alaykum. You know when we say Salaam alaykum really quick to each other? Salaam alaykum. Assalamu alaykum means may the curse of Allah be upon you. Right? Assalamu alaykum means may the peace of Allah be upon you. So this group of people in Medina, when they would say Assalamu alaykum, 
they were actually saying to the Prophet ﷺ, may Allah curse you. And the Prophet ﷺ understood that. And Aisha radiallahu anha understood that. So Prophet ﷺ is walking. And these people always say, Assalamu alaikum. And the Prophet ﷺ goes, Wa alaikum. <laughs> he smiles and he says simply, and upon you. Right? So if you said as salam, then may it be upon you. And if you, you know, and it was accidental that you quickly said salam and it sounded like salam, then may it be upon you. And if you said curse, may it be upon you. Right? Aisha radiallahu anha, she couldn't tolerate this. So whenever this group of people said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, As-salamu alaykum, right? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she answered, Wa alaykum as-salam, wa la'natullah, wa ghadab. You know? And may the, may, the curse of, may, the, may the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you, and the damnation of Allah, and His anger. And the Prophet sallallahu says, Whoa, hold on Aisha, why are you doing that? She said, Ya Rasulullah, they're not saying salam to you. They're cursing you. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Didn't you hear what I responded to? I simply said, Wa alaykum, and upon you. And the Prophet sallallahu said some very beautiful words to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. He said, Inna Allah yuhibbu rifq fil amnikum. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves gentleness in all of your affairs. He always loves gentleness. And so if someone is insulting you and attacking you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that you express gentleness. And as the brother was reading, uh, and he didn't complete, but in the end of the ayah, اِتْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ Always repel evil with good, and you would find that your greatest enemy, your most stern enemy, will turn into your wali, your protective friend, your hameem, someone who always accompanies you, your shadow. Why? Because you demonstrated good manners, right? Now, we don't have to do that. Society does not expect us to let those things go. But if, you're, if you have the quality of ihsan, and you're searching for the, the, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and your interest is being elevated in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then who cares about society standards? I'm going to do it anyway, right? And, and Rasulullah sallallahu was the one who tolerated the most insults. Once he was sitting with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We know Abu Bakr was a very gentle man. And Abu Bakr would not stand up for himself, but if he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being insulted, then that drove him insane, you know, subhanAllah. So he's sitting with the Prophet ﷺ and some people are coming and verbally assaulting the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr. And the Prophet ﷺ is sitting there looking at them and smiling. He's not saying anything. Until Abu Bakr who stands up and he starts to talk back to them. As soon as Abu Bakr stands up, the Prophet ﷺ leaves. And Abu Bakr became, you know, he was worried. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Ya Rasulullah, what did you leave? Did I say something wrong? He said, no. The Prophet ﷺ said, but whenever we were being attacked, when they were speaking that way, the angels were there responding to them. And whenever you responded, the angels left, so I decided to leave too. SubhanAllah, who, whose pleasure are you seeking? You know, who, who do you look for? And which standards do you seek to fulfill? So SubhanAllah, this is the second one. They swallow their anger completely. They swallow their anger. Then the third one, which is, which is the, the main point of the topic, on top of just swallowing their anger, you know, sometimes when someone is insulting you or someone does something wrong to you, you're not in a position to defend yourself. So you smile in their face and inside yourself, you're, you're grinning and you're thinking to yourself, when I get my chance, I'm <laughs> You wait till I'm in a position of power, inshallah. Thank you. Then you go home and you start plotting and planning and things of that sort. And you, and you start wishing, you know, one day I'll get my revenge on that person. Right? But here, to pardon people, those who pardon people, not those who pardon people who didn't do anything to them in the first place, or not those who pardon people that are in a position of power, or that are above you, so it really doesn't matter if you pardon them. It's like, subhanAllah, whenever you're sitting around and, and you know, there's, there's a person in office or in government, you say, I forgive that person. Yeah, it's easy if you forgive him now. But what if, what if the roles changed? What if you were in a different situation, he was in a different situation, and that person is now under your control? And you have the ability to exact your revenge upon that person, to take your retaliation. So society would expect you to do that, right? Society expects you to, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Right? That's what society expects of you. Justice. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adl wal ihsan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you and enjoins you with adl, with justice and compassion. Ihsan. And Imam al Qayyim rahimahullah said, Wal ihsan yafuq al adl. Ihsan is more important than adl. Compassion is more important than justice. So sometimes people say, what does Islam believe? Do we believe an eye for an eye or do we, do we believe turn the other cheek? It's in between. What Islam believes is that if a person is wrong, he has the right to take back his retaliation and his revenge. But if he chooses for his individual good and seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to turn the other cheek, he'll be rewarded for that. Right? So sometimes I ask people, you know, I'll ask Muslims, do we believe in the death penalty? Raise your hand if you think we believe in the death penalty. Do we not believe in the death penalty? Raise your hand if you don't know. Do you understand my American? <laughs> the correct answer is we don't believe in the death penalty. We believe in qisas. That in an Islamic state under Islamic rule, if someone murders the other person, it's not the state versus you. It's not the state versus the murderer. And the state goes out and carries out the death penalty. It goes back to the family, those who were most affected by that loss. And they are given the option. Either that person can be killed, al-qatl bil-qatl, right? Or you can forgive. And you're encouraged to forgive, right? You're encouraged to let that person go. Now, of course, if this is a mass murderer, then, then the hakim has to step in and, and, take, you know, and take matters into his own hands. But you're encouraged to forgive. Right? So you can take back your revenge, you can demand your right, but if you forego your right seeking an ease in the hereafter, then it will be better for you. SubhanAllah. They still bring themselves to where they can pardon people. And you know, I'll give you an example of why this is so important. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man la yarham la yurham. Whoever does not show mercy will not have mercy shown to him. Right? Imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to hold us accountable for everything that we did. Imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment held us accountable for every single one of our actions and punished us for all of our sins. We would all be in trouble, right? And essentially on the day of judgment, like in Qurtubi rahimahullah said, you either meet the justice of Allah or you meet the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't want to meet the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> right? Because as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ سُئِلَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ Whoever is questioned on the day of judgment, فَقَدْ هَلَكْ And in another narration, عُذِّبْ Whoever is asked on the day of judgment will perish. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, but doesn't everyone get asked? Right? But as, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينَ فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابَ يَسِيرًا That the one who receives his book in his right hand, he'll be given an easy accountability. So doesn't everyone ask, right? I mean, isn't everyone asked on the Day of Judgment? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, لَا يَا عَائِشْ No, O Aisha radiallahu anha. That is al-'awd. That's your deeds being presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you to account for your deeds, then you're in trouble. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the believer, for the one who is sincere, for the one who made effort, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings your deeds forth and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you how He has forgiven them. Right? And then you get your book in the right hand. Right? Then you have to go have your book weighed. Right? Then you have to have your deeds weighed. Right? The angels, subhanAllah, they're not actually going to weigh in al mizan you know, with, 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 the, with the exact balance, your good deeds and your bad deeds. If you received your book in the right hand, go ahead, we know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you. Right? You either meet the mercy or the justice of Allah, and you really want to meet the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the greatest ways to meet the mercy and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment is to be a forgiving person in this dunya towards those that harm you. Right? People don't expect that from you. But you should have that expectation of yourself because you're seeking ihsan. And I'll give you an example from the life of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the worst thing that, that could happen to him sallallahu alayhi wa and that happened to his family is when Aisha radiallahu anha was slandered and accused of zina, accused of committing adultery. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not harm Aisha, 
He did not yell at her. He didn't chastise her, but he was hurt. He was hurt by this. This talk was going on all over the place, and he was very hurt by this. Right? Those who spread this rumor, those you know, those who were who were spreading the slander, and we know how juicy talk can get. Right? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was left behind, you know, in, in an expedition when they were coming back. And so she was brought back by Safwan radiallahu ta'ala anha. And whenever they were entering into Al Madina, Aisha radiallahu anha never talked to Safwan. She was on her camel and Safwan was pulling the camel. And Abdullah ibn Ubayd ibn Salul, the chief of the hypocrites, here's what he does. Here's how he sheds, sheds uh, doubt. He says, Wallahi ma salima minha. He, did, he was not free from her, he did not escape her, and she did not escape him. That's all he said. Then started, just like we have now, you know, like in our Muslim community, CNN and Fox News and Sky News and everyone else. <laughs> I don't know which one is more reliable. I know Fox News is the one that's ridiculous. I don't know if you guys get Fox News over here. But the talking started. And this hurt the Prophet ﷺ, and this hurt Aisha obviously, her honor is being taken away from her, you know. And who was the father of Aisha? Abu Bakr as-Siddiq And whenever the revelation in Surah An-Nur came down, absolving Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha of the accusation, Abu Bakr was there and the Prophet ﷺ was there. And it was the ayat 10 to 20 in Surah An-Nur. And guess what? One of the people who slandered Aisha radiallahu anha, the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, was one of the people, his name was Mistah, that Abu Bakr used to give money to every day. He was a poor man that Abu Bakr used to give money to every day. You can imagine if you're in this situation, this guy just ruined my daughter's life. And I was giving money to him every day. He was, and he's a poor man, you know, I was watching out for him every day. So, subhanAllah, what would you do if you're in that situation? You would go to that person, you say, give me back all the money I've given you for the last year or two. And that's, that's understandable. All of us would understand that if a person did that. But, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu didn't even say that. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I'm not going to give him any more. As simple as that. SubhanAllah, was mistah? Okay, I'm just not going to give him any more. That's not even taking back your revenge, right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an ayah. فَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ SubhanAllah, if the Prophet ﷺ was making this Qur'an up, you really think he would bring this ayah? Because his wife was the one that was slandered, and this was one of the worst periods of six months of his life, sallallahu Allah revealed at the response of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, let them forgive and pardon. Wouldn't you love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you and pardons you? The man whose daughter was, sl was, was slandered, he's not going to hurt this person, but he's going to stop giving him charity and Allah is telling him, keep giving him charity. Because you know what, as human beings, we mess up and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still gives us. It's not just that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us. He still gives us, right? So we have to understand this concept. Why do I forgive? I want the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have five minutes? Or a little more. Okay. Why do I... I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me on the day of judgment, right? And this is a concept that is well established in our deen. مَنْ سَتَرَ مُسْلِمَا سَتَرَهُ اللَّهُ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Whoever covers his brother or sister, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cover him on the day of judgment, right? You forgive someone else, Allah will forgive you on the Day of Judgment. You show mercy with people, Allah will show mercy to you on the Day of Judgment. And we all know the famous story of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting with the companions, and he said, you're about to see a person who's from the people of paradise. And so this guy is unknown. He's not like Abu Bakr, he's not Umar radiallahu anhu, he's not, you know, Suhaib al-Rumi, he's not Bilal ibn Rabah, he's not someone, you know, who's known to the companions. So Abdullah ibn Umar, what does he do? He says, this guy is going to paradise, I want to accompany him and figure out what he does. So Abdullah ibn Umar, someone who prays Qiyam extensively, who, who reads Qur'an extensively, he goes and he's, he, he asks this person to accompany him and he spends three days with him. When he spends three days with him, he wants to see, you know, during the day is he fasting? No, he's eating his lunch. Then at night, he just, he, he doesn't wake up for Qiyam al -Nid. he's not waking up to offer prayers throughout the night. Abdullah ibn Umar is waking up to do Qiyam at night and he's not waking up to do Qiyam at night. And he's not noticing any, any particular regimen of reading Qur'an or any partic particular regimen of making tasbih. He's a very, he's the average Joe, right? And Abdullah ibn Umar is just driving, you know, why you? You know, subhanAllah, out of all of the companions, what makes you that person? What makes you so, you know, so, so forgiven, right? And what guarantees you paradise? He says, well, I mean, the only thing I can think of every night before I go to sleep, 
I pardon everyone first and foremost from the heart. I forgive everyone from the heart. Then I make dua for those people. SubhanAllah, Ihsan, Wallahu yuhibbu al This is how Allah ended that ayah. Allah loves those who do good. The people that harm me, I make dua for them. Not in front of their faces, like today whenever we say, may Allah forgive you, it's an insult. Right? It's to say that I'm right and you're wrong. So if two people are having an argument, Allah is samhak, may Allah forgive you. Allah is khbir lak yaakhi, may Allah forgive you. Right? You're saying that to say you're wrong and I'm right. Right? That's an insult. Right? But whenever you're actually alone, if you say, fa'fu anhum, you know, as, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lahum, and you seek forgiveness for them, imagine, right, this person harmed me today. So when I'm sitting tonight alone in my bed, making dua to Allah, I'm going to say, oh Allah, forgive this person. He probably had an excuse. He was probably having a bad day. That's enough to guarantee you paradise. And then, the, you know, and then secondly, uh, I'll just mention two more points, inshaAllah ta'ala. Whenever you forgive, make sure that you're also forgetting, right? As Rasulullah says how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does with us, التَّائِبُ مِنَ الذَّمْ كَمَنْ لَا ذَنْبَ لَهْ That the one who repents from a sin is like the one who never sinned in the first place. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not hold any grudges with you. Right? And it's not like if you go back to the sin, Allah is going to all of a sudden rehash the other times that you sin. And put them all together to increase punishment or things of that sort. When you repent, khalas, Allah is ghafoor. Ghafran is to cover something. Allah covers it up, buries the hatchet, it's gone. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ghafoor rahim Then Allah expresses mercy, right? Notice how Allah uses the, com the, the combination of His names. Ghafoor rahim He covers it up, buries the hatchet, He shows you mercy and compassion as if nothing ever happened in the first place. But of course, Allah doesn't forget in the true sense of the word. But whenever we're talking about forgiven, forget. It's extremely important that we truly mean that. Right, now I'll give you an example. Let's say that, you know, you know, it's, it's, this, it's this typical example that you see in Hollywood, right? The corruption that we Americans sent to you guys, right? The typical example that you see in a movie where let's say that a person, you know, uh, a man messed up or something like that and, 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 he, was, uh, and he said something to another woman that, that his wife didn't like, right? And then he says, I'm sorry, I'm seeking forgiveness, I, I can't believe I did that, you know, uh, please forgive me. And even if he's sincere, usually he's not sincere in Hollywood, but even if he's sincere, right? And then what really happens in reality, when they go back to, to the marketplace, and what, what do you guys have here instead of Walmart, what were you telling me? What is it? Tesco. Okay, whatever it is, Texco, whatever it is. <laughs> the point is, is that you go to the grocery store and you're at the register, and if it's a woman there, right? And he just smiles at the woman, and she's going to turn around and hit him with his purse, with her purse, right? You know, how dare you? Why are you looking at her like that? Why are you talking? Meaning what? It's still in her memory. Right? Or if two brothers have, you know, have, have a, a fight, an argument, and someone really changes himself, and he says, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And then you say, don't worry about it, man, it's over. And then the minute that he even shows, you know, a hint of returning back to that behavior, I knew you never changed. I knew you were the same person. Right? But Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us Yusuf alayhi salam, whose brothers actually sought out to end his life. Right? He was living the life, he was the, you know, the favorite child in a family of prophethood, and his brothers threw him into a well, and he goes into slavery, and he goes into, you know, into prison. He goes through all of these rough stages of his life for 21 years, then he sees his brothers, and he's in a position of power. Yusuf is now the king. He's, you know, and, and his brothers are coming and asking for grain, they're asking for food because they're suffering from drought. And his brothers don't recognize who he is. And Yusuf السلام, right then and there would be completely justified to say, okay, you guys tried to kill me and now I'm the king, I'm going to kill you all. Or at least I'm going to make you live a miserable life. Or at least I'm not going to give you any food. Right? I'm not going to give you anything to, you know, that you came and asked for. But Yusuf السلام, whenever his brothers figure out who he is, and you can imagine they're saying, oh, we're so sorry. Right? How sincere would that apology be? I mean, think about it. Or, or how sincere would the one who's in power perceive it? Right? He'd say, you're just saying that now because you're in trouble. The first words Yusuf السلام, says to them is, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. Look, don't worry about it. There's no blame upon you today. Gives them an, an, a, a great life. And then when Yusuf السلام, meets his father, Yaqub again, the one that cried himself blind over him. Right? And Yusuf السلام, is, ascends his throne. And he praises and thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his position. 
and he starts to remember, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved me from this trial and this trial. He starts to remember all of his hard moments in life. He doesn't even mention the time that he spent in the well. He doesn't even mention it. Why? Because he told his brothers, forget about it. That's a three ba'alikum al He didn't even mention it when he was thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala publicly for saving him from the hardships of his life. But this was the root of it all, was that your brothers threw you into a well. That's a three ba'alikum al those were the same words that the Prophet ﷺ said when the Prophet ﷺ entered Mecca. And people want to accuse our religion of being barbaric and they want to say that the Prophet ﷺ was a man of violence and a man of... By any standard of war and ethics of war, the people of Mecca could have all been killed by the Prophet ﷺ. They killed his family members, they ran him out, they put, placed him under boycott. You know, his wife died under that boycott, his uncle died under that boycott. They took, they, they mutilated his uncle, uh, Hamza radiallahu anhu, chewed his liver and spit it out, humiliated the Muslims for all these years, 20 years, over 20 years. And the Prophet sallallahu when he's coming back now and he's in power, right? He could have at least went after the people that committed those acts of violence and the people that ruined, you know, that ruined that, that aspect of his life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some of the Sahaba had it built up. So one of the companions said, Al yawm yawm al malhama. Today is the day of revenge. And the Prophet ﷺ says, No, today is the day of marhama. Today is the day of mercy. And when the Prophet ﷺ walked into Mecca, when he, when he came into Mecca, he could have been the arrogant conqueror, right, with his chest puffed out. I, here's, you know, here I am now. This is the one that you threw, this is the one that you abandoned. This is the one who you've been humiliating, you're all in trouble. And everyone expected, by the way, that revenge would be taken out on them. The Prophet ﷺ had his head so close to his animal, to his riding beast, that his face was almost touching its back, out of humility. And the Prophet ﷺ was telling them, you can come out, you're safe. Look, it's forgotten. You're forgiven and it's forgotten. Why is that so important? And this is the last point, I promise you this is the last point, inshaAllah ta'ala. Why is that so important for us? It's not just, subhanAllah, that we forgive so that we can be forgiven on the Day of Judgment. You know, I was reading in the Pittsburgh uh, Medical Journal, I, I remember this, the benefits of forgiveness in a person's life, in terms of his dunya, in terms of his worldly life, right? So, so medically speaking, you have lower blood pressure. Medically speaking, you have a better heart rate. Medically speaking, you have a longer lifespan. Medically speaking, uh, statistically, they actually prove that a person who has a forgiving mentality or someone who lets things go a lot is more likely to be involved in volunteerism and charity and things of that sort. So you're able to do good, right? Because you're not bitter. Is able to still have good relationships with other people because the bitterness is not carrying over to other relationships. So there's benefit in this world. But for your spirituality, your heart, as Imam Al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, is a space. You fill your heart with as much love and hate as you want to. But the more hate you put in it, or the more love of anything else other than your Lord, the less capacity there will be to love your Lord. Right? And that's why there's a very, very powerful statement. To hold a grudge is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. You're only hurting yourself when you hold grudges. You're only hurting yourself when you don't forgive other people. Because by letting that you know, stay around in your heart, by holding those grudges, by holding that hate, you're not allowing yourself to focus on what? Your own spiritual progression, your own love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your own pursuit of mercy. So do not let the hate for someone else derail you. Because at the end of the day, you're actually allowing that person to have victory. And don't think, well, I don't want to forgive someone and then it comes back, you know, it comes back to haunt me later on in life. And as one of the salaf said, he said that I would rather regret forgiving someone than regret not forgiving someone. Right? Regret letting a grudge hold on and then that person dies while we had a grudge and then the hurt continues because I should have forgiven him, I should have made things better, that's my wife, that's my, my father, that's my mother, that's my son, that's my brother, that was my best friend, right? The hurt there and the hurt on your spirituality, this all affects your heart. So let it go for your own good. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us a forgiving people inshaAllah ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us a people of mercy and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us a people worthy of His mercy and forgiveness and compassion. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khayran.